Do you enjoy the harvest of Missouri through food, fuel, or fiber? Interested in strengthening your community or making a difference in the lives of others? You're in the right place. This is Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. Join us for thoughtful conversations around the intersections of farmer, rancher, and consumer interests. Grab a seat, press play, and join the conversation. Welcome back to another episode of Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. We sure appreciate you tuning in and joining us. And we're excited about a timely conversation we're going to have today with Steve Struberg. He is the state veterinarian, works for the Department of Agriculture, and helps protect and regulate for protection our animal agriculture industry in the state of Missouri. Welcome, Dr. Struberg. Hey, thank you. Uh, Happy to be here, and thanks for the opportunity. Yes, it's great to have you. So Dr. Struberg is just for a little background. He's a graduate of the University of Missouri Veterinary um, School. He has been with the Department of Agriculture as our state veterinarian for almost three years after coming to the Department of Agriculture from um, years of private practice in the Herman area and brought a wealth of experience to state government on the practical intersection of animal health and agriculture Um, in that regulatory role. So we appreciate the time you've put in, Dr. Struberg. We know it's been a busy time in agriculture. And so thanks for taking the time to join us. Oh, you're you're welcome. We're happy to do it. This is a part of what we want to do. We want to reach out to producers and citizens in general to make them aware of what we're doing and, and get their help in many instances. Yeah, we thought this would be a timely conversation because it's getting ready. I mean, not only do we have some animal health emerging disease issues going on in Missouri, but more importantly, proactively, we were looking at it's about to be show season, animals are going to be moving throughout the state. And so let's just kick it off with a little bit of biosecurity. You can go either way, Dr. Struberg, um, highly pathogenic avian influenza or general biosecurity that we see on the farm, best practices that uh, you see that that the Department of Agriculture recommends? Okay, well, yeah, just gen- in general, biosecurity is a, just an asset to any operation. It's, it's gonna protect your profitability, certainly protect the animal health, and in many instances, protect human health on your operation. So you, you can go to our, our website, agriculture.mo.gov, and if you backslash biosecurity, you can get most directly to a lot of information about setting up secure food supply plans for, for your operation, uh, looking into getting your premises identification updated, and making sure you have that in place. And what, what those do is it will help teach you some biosecurity particulars for your type of operation, the premises ID will allow us to contact you if we have some sort of disease of note in your region that we want to reach out and make you aware of and, and help you maybe increase your level of biosecurity to protect your flock or your herd. So the department has been encouraging registration of premise IDs for at least a decade in my knowledge. So tell us um, the whys of premise identification and what information a producer needs to disclose to get a premise ID. Yeah, so the really the, the purpose of that would be for us to be aware that you have which species of animals. So in, in the avian influenza episode that's going on right now, then we would know if you have poultry or some sort of avian species on, on your premise, and then we could make you aware of the situation to uh, reach out, see if you're having any health problems in your flock. And if so, we, we could provide some free testing to uh, mm-hmm. determine what's going on. So uh, the types of information we want is, is the types of species you have, confirm your location so we know uh, if you're inside of a zone because once we have an infected premises, then we uh, will draw a circle around that. And usually in a, a 10 or 20 kilometer region, then we need to make these notifications and and potentially at some point do some testing if it's warranted. And it's really just address and contact information. So you have that. So tell us how this has played out as many have probably seen in the news by now. um, Highly pathogenic avian influenza has been on the move across the United States. 
we know it's been confirmed in some southern tier counties. So tell us about that and how that um, disease containment effort works at the department. Well, uh, certainly once we get a positive test, usually it's due to some symptoms with the high pathologic avian influenza. It's, it's usually quite noticeable on the operation. So it happens pretty quickly. And uh, we like to confirm detection in 24 hours, maybe just three or four hours potentially uh, as to that's the disease that's there. And uh, if that's the case, then to contain the, the virus, we need to eliminate the virus from that premises and then start uh, making these contacts in surrounding areas to, to see if potentially the, the disease has already spread. And uh, we'll also uh, check animal movements, uh, vehicle movements, personnel movements, and and make sure that there hasn't been a spread. And thankfully, uh, most of these uh, poultry operations, they have pretty good biosecurity. So uh, even though it has made it onto their place, uh, most likely from uh, wild birds, it hasn't spread. And we're very thankful of that. And that seems to be the story throughout the United States this year in this outbreak. And uh, I, I would add that uh, we, we have had reports of uh, wild, boar, wild bird infections uh, in several areas of the state and several areas of the Midwest and Eastern United States. So mm -hmm. just uh, want people to be aware of that and for them to uh, be sure their biosecurity is restricting uh, their poultry from uh, mixing with wild birds. Mm -hmm. Yep, and on the consumer side of the equation then, um, avian influenza, still means that that's a that's a illness of the birds right so that does not impact meat poultry meat or eggs because we any cooking would take care of any threat there is that right yeah the, the cooking and processing uh, mechanisms that are in place would, would certainly uh, prevent that um, and it is yes it's avian influenza but it is an avian it is an influenza virus so we do take precautions while on site with the personnel, especially in, in the uh, confined, confined environments to, to be sure personnel is, is extra safe. So they'll, they'll guard against that. And also uh, I wanna emphasize how thankful we're, we are to the uh, Department of Health. They work closely <laughs> with us and in the uh, local people to make sure that they are aware that uh, there is a remote possibility of the virus mutating and at some point to where it could affect humans. And uh, thankfully with this strain that, that has not occurred anywhere in the United States. And, but we're just wanna make sure everybody is aware and on the lookout. Yep. The meat, like, as you said, the meat is very safe. Uh, the eggs, all those poultry products are safe by the time they reach the marketplace and are consumed after cooking, et cetera. Yep. So while we're on um, emerging diseases and in that role in your role as state vet, let's talk a little bit about African swine fever. It's a threat to the United States yet contained, but found closer and closer to our shores. Give us a little bit of history of that disease and all the work that the Department of Ag, USDA and many others are doing to help prevent African swine fever from coming to the United States swine That's herds. Cool. Sure. As the name indicates, African swine fever, it's, it's a viral disease that uh, can be devastating economically and health-wise to swine herds. And it, it's based, uh, you know, for, I guess, historically in Africa, mm -hmm. as you would believe. Uh, there's been major outbreak in China the last several years. And, uh, and that's, you know, them being the largest uh, pork producer, it's uh, been very devastating to their industry. Uh, it has spread beyond China into Asia and uh, Eastern Europe, and now more recently in the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic has, has been diagnosed, Dominican Republic and, and Haiti. So uh, the United States Department of Agriculture is working very closely with those countries to keep it contained there and prevent it uh, from spreading to the United States. Uh, they're very diligent uh, in Puerto Rico specifically, and since it is so close and uh, seem to be uh, protecting Puerto Rico and uh, 
in all of the United States. So we work with the United States Department of Agriculture and all the other states to, uh, mm -hmm. to be prepared to uh, keep it contained if it would arrive to a very small area, mm -hmm. hopefully prevent it from ever entering. Mm -hmm. Which is a Herculean task because I've sat in conversations. There's a lot of points of entry in, the, in this country. So it's not just um, live pigs that we're worried about, but feed and animal products. And so that is a big task that uh, a tip of the hat to everybody who's working on that, because it will be a, a long-term area or issue of concern that we certainly want to keep out of the United States and the pork production system that we have that is so efficient and does a good job at biosecurity, but um, would be a significant threat. So Tell, shifting gears a little bit, um, let's talk a little bit about show season. It's show season prep. Um, lots of our seasoned exhibitors know about biosecurity and receive training through 4-H, FFA, and other venues, but uh, what are some best practices to those of us moving animals throughout the state for the summer or even out of state for that livestock ex exhibition season? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, certainly work initially with your project leaders and your veterinarians to make sure that your herd is healthy from the outset. If there's ever any health concern uh, with your animals uh, before moving, then, uh, you know, don't take that risk and move them, number one. We need to protect the, the other exhibitors, et cetera, and the other animals that attend. Uh, once you arrive at uh, an exhibition, uh, most likely your animals are going to get examined again as, as they arrive preferably before they're ever unloaded to uh, be sure that uh, they arrive healthy. Many times uh, they will be examined by a veterinarian recently uh, back at your home, uh, but uh, most exhibitions like to have somebody on staff to see that they arrive healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. Once they're there, you know, you go ahead and learn if you don't know already biosecurity principles, but uh, prevent your animals from mingling, uh, being exposed to other animals, uh, don't do your best. I know it's in, it's not uh, possible to be entirely biosecure at an exhibition, but uh, do your best there. Keep the areas clean. Uh, a lot of times they'll have an opportunity to mingle in common areas. Try to keep those areas clean, potentially sanitize in between, etc. Uh, if you do have an issue, then notify uh, the staff there at the exhibition. If there are veterinarians uh, available, notify them uh, immediately and, and they will try to contain whatever disease mm -hmm. might arise. Uh, so certainly uh, after the show, then most likely you're gonna return home. And at that time, it's, it's really important to quarantine your animals separate from the rest of your herd. You'd, uh, if you have a herd back home that's potentially naive to something that uh, your pigs or your birds or your cattle brought home, you, you want to keep them separate. So uh, it's a good idea to keep them separate for, for up to 30 days, whatever you have the facilities for, et cetera. So uh, those are certainly good recommendations to uh, prevent the spread of disease within your own herd. You don't want to bring anything back home to your, to your healthy animals. Tell us a little bit, I think this is state by state, but as we're traveling out of state, um, is it always prudent to check that state's regulations for bringing animals into the state or crossing state lines? Yes, it would be the destination state. So if, if you're going to other states, be sure and uh, check with that state what the requirements are uh, commonly, depending on the species and, and your destination, you're gonna to have to have a, an accredited veterinarian write you a certificate of veterinary inspection, that depending on what that is. Again, they may or may not have to, uh, prior to your arrival, receive a permit from that receiving state to uh, ensure that you've uh, reached all those requirements. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wonderful. Well, you guys, anything else that we haven't hit on that we should talk about on the animal health disease containment biosecurity front? Well, other than just, uh, you know, I'll just be aware that we're here to try and help uh, all producers in Missouri and keep their animals healthy. If they have any questions or concerns, be sure and reach out to us. And uh, certainly we work very closely with all of the veterinarians within Missouri and uh, we can, uh, 
be contacted through them or directly. I think that's good advice. I found the Department of Ag uh, Animal Health team to be there to help. And so I would love to dive into just a few other areas that you, you have responsibility over at the Department of Agriculture, that one being um, meat inspection. So our meat industry we've talked about here on the show before is growing by leaps and bounds in the state of Missouri with a lot of support and investment post COVID to ensure a robust and resilient food supply system. So tell us a little bit about the growth in your meat inspection program and the role that the Department of Agriculture plays in ensuring that healthy, wholesome meat supply and processing. Yeah, within our animal health division, we have a, a rather large uh, and growing uh, meat inspection team. So uh, they work with uh, many of the processors throughout the state of Missouri. Uh, we have uh, on-site inspectors for, for those products that uh, require that. Uh, also, we, we do license the custom exempt smaller plants that, uh, that process animals for, for return to the farm, et cetera. So uh, our team has grown a lot. We, we also were involved with some grants that were administered a couple of years ago uh, to help these plants expand to allow for increased local processing. Mm -hmm. So we are constantly uh, hiring new inspectors, training new inspectors. Uh, so they're on site making sure that those meat products uh, arrive healthy and leave healthy from those plants. Yep, that's certainly an important role in that all farm or all meat sold needs to be processed under inspection, correct? That's, that's correct. So uh, anything that enters uh, into the case, it, it has been expected either by uh, Missouri Department of Ag or United States Department of Ag employees, inspectors, to be sure that it's uh, a safe product. Uh, and then a little bit different than that would be those that custom exempt slaughtering were where the animal's going back to the owner, then uh, we're not always on site for that entire process. But uh, though all those plants do have to go through certain guidelines and, and we check on them regularly. Yep, okay. Um, you guys also provide inspection and regulation of Missouri's dog breeding industry. Would you like to touch on that? Well, yeah, so AGFA Animal Care Facilities Act, that's what that program uh, stands for. And, yeah, that, that's a that's a rather large group too of inspectors that uh, that go out and make sure everybody's properly licensed and properly inspected and and they're caring for their these pets that they're raising properly. So it's uh, primarily dog breeders, a few cat breeders, and then we also do license and inspect uh, rescues and those related entities. I often mention that. Um, in conversations about animal feeding operations in Missouri, that Missouri is not the wild, wild west. We've had a long, well-structured um, regulatory system that oversees, in that case, animal feeding operations. I would stand behind and say the same thing about our dog breeding program, the Animal Care Facilities Act, and that um, this is not new. Missouri has been a leader in dog breeding and a leader in ensuring quality and control and um, in inspecting and making sure that all is up to par on our dog breeding facilities. Would you say the same? Yes, I agree. I think we're really top notch in that regard. We, uh, our inspectors work very hard and uh, they try to uh, help those uh, producers in, in that industry uh, operate properly and, and help them keep their animals healthy and uh, Hopefully it's a, you know, it's a profitable entity for them so they can be sustainable and, uh, and help those rural areas where, yep. where they usually occur. Yes, from my understanding, you know, dog breeding, like animal feeding, like a, a barn that has um, hogs or poultry or something else can often be that diversified line of income that allows a farm family to keep people on the farm to diversify income outside of corn, soybeans, or the livestock enterprise that's otherwise going on that provides, as you said, that rural economic engine. And um, those, the folks that I know in the dog breeding industry are certainly examples of the same sort of care and concern that we invest in our 
uh, livestock operations statewide that is the bar that's set for the care that we give our animals. Um, one other topic, so you may, you may, I, the one I'm going to pull next is a very small element, probably of what you do. We have a brand, our, our own personal operation has a brand registered for, with the state of Missouri. Tell us a little bit about Missouri's brand registry. Yeah. So in, in our uh, division also, we do have a brand registry. So if, if you want a brand for your, uh, your operation, you register that with us. So, uh, so you have that unique brand here in Missouri and it's not duplicated by another operation, uh. We are not a brand state. Uh, other states that rely heavily on brands for identification, they actually have inspectors at uh, markets and places where livestock gather to uh, verify that those brands match with the ownership of those, the reported ownership of those animals. We, we do not do that, but we do have a registry. So if, if you want to have a unique brand, uh, you can register that with us and uh, uh, there are probably thousands of those that we have registered and uh, people uh, like to utilize on their operations. Yep. Well, thank you for that conversation. Is there anything else that we should hit on that um, takes your, your team's time and attention in providing that quality oversight to Missouri's animal industry? Well, we're, you know, we're involved in all corners of the state whenever we're called upon to uh, maybe give some sort of advice to uh, many local entities if, if there are concerns. Uh, a lot of times it's not our jurisdiction, but we, but we do like to offer our advice when we're available. So we, that's another, just another thing that some of our staff does on occasion. And, but yep. uh, once again, as I said earlier, we were, we're here to uh, offer uh information and advice on, on areas that if we can help keep people's uh, operations sustainable and healthy. Yep. Tell us again how people can get a hold of the um, state veterinarian's office or the animal health division of the Department of Agriculture. Well, our, our website is agriculture.mo.gov and there's just tons of contact information there for, for almost everybody in the division. So there, that is accessible there. And then, uh, certainly they, they can call our office too. Do you want that number? Sure. Sure. So our main line of contact would be 573-751-3377. Wonderful. And the no cost confidential premise identification link was agriculture.mo.gov backslash premise ID? Biosecurity. Backslash oh, biosecurity. you do that. Okay. So you put that in there since I messed it up. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. And Truthfully, too, if somebody doesn't want to uh, utilize the internet for that or doesn't have the capability, they can call that very same phone number I recited, talk to one of our staff members, and, and they can do all of that over the telephone. And uh, I do want to emphasize while we're talking premises ID, it's entirely voluntary in Missouri, but there are advantages for you to have your, your premise registered. That way, we'll be able to contact you if needed. And once again, we can only utilize that information in the instance of a disease outbreak. Wonderful. We appreciate it. Appreciate your time in taking time in a busy week to join us and share these insights. Thanks for your partnership and thanks for joining us today. Appreciate the opportunity. You have a good day. You too. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. Tune in next week for a conversation with Lauren Farmeyer about local foods, all things local foods, where to find them, um, challenges and opportunities, and it's sure to be a passionate and energetic conversation with Lauren. So until next time, take care. Thank you for joining the Stand for Ag podcast with Missouri Farmers Care. We're excited to bring you new stories each week. We as agriculturalists have a lot of stories to tell stories of resilience, grit, and stories of families that are united by their passion for agriculture. Each week, tune in for a new episode and join the conversation.